Friends, good morning. It is uh, great to see each of you here this morning and also so many of you who are with us online. Welcome in the name of Christ. Uh, as always, you saw the uh, announcements. There are so many ways that we can be in touch with one another. Uh, remember uh, our text in church if you'd like to let us know that you're here. If you want to share a prayer request with us, we'd love to have that and uh, lift that person up uh, as a congregation, also as a staff. Uh, also, if you'd like to know more about the church or talk with me about becoming more involved or a member here at Crestview, you can use uh, the text in church and I'll reach out to you. A couple other things, uh, beyond the bulletin, that's how we uh, communicate with one another as well as our website, but beyond the bulletin, uh, you, if you saw the video, I mentioned a stewardship letter, that goes out tomorrow, and uh, in that letter there'll be a link to our church budget, a detailed uh, budget. If you are not on our church mailing list, there are only about 250 households who get that, but would like uh, to see the church budget if you're a part of our online congregation or uh, worship with us, some at home and some online, but you're not a member here, uh, reach out to me. Uh, give me a phone call or an email, and I'll share that information with you. Also, on Beyond the Bulletin, I learned about some small groups that are going on here in the church. Uh, our mission team has a number of things going on. Uh, Family Promise, we need some help with that. Also, uh, watch for uh, opportunities to share this year at Christmas. Uh, speaking of Christmas, in the Fellowship Hall, you might see a number of our children and adults walking by in the narthex. It's our Operation Christmas Child, and so they're doing that as well today. So uh, that's kind of what I learned in Beyond the Bulletin, and so if you would like to uh, give to Crestview, you can do that online, and again, go to our website, and you can find out how, or you can leave uh, a check in the offering plate uh, at the back of the church. Uh, the session met this morning, and we uh, received two new members to our church family. I'd like to invite Carol Ann McElmurray and Annette Sigler to join me down here at the front. And while they're coming down, it's interesting, as we were chatting this morning, we have one who's joining our church who grew up in New Knoxville, Ohio. Does anyone know where New Knoxville, Ohio is? Is there an old Knoxville, Ohio? No, there's not an old Knoxville, just a new Knoxville. This is Annette Sigler, that's where she grew up. And, uh, and Carol Ann, she grew up in the Bronx. And so we have a real difference here this morning, that's interesting. So let me just introduce them to you. First of all, uh, Carol Ann, uh, she came to this church because Lauren and Tim Umbaugh, Lauren is her daughter. And uh, of course, Eli and Asher are her grandchildren. And uh, she's been coming here for up and on a couple years now and uh, just sort of felt comfortable here, felt called to be here and to enter into a deeper covenant with the church. And so uh, we're just delighted that, that you're here, uh, very mission-minded. And so we're looking forward to having you uh, partner with us in mission. Uh, uh, Carol Ann had a career in sales and marketing, but before sales and marketing, when she was young, she was a beautician. And I have some questions I'd like to ask you. <laughs> I cut my own hair. Is there anything I could do differently? Or better. You're doing a great job. I'm doing a great job. Thank you very much. <laughs> Not what I'm told, but that's good. Anyway, uh, Caroline, welcome. This is Annette Sigler. Uh, Annette is married to Don. They have three children. I mentioned she's from New Knoxville, Ohio. Uh, she's a nurse here at Westchester Hospital. So if you recognize her, maybe you've seen her there at the uh, hospital. Uh, she'll be uh, quite possibly joining the choir. Uh, she's been an elder and a deacon in a Presbyterian church. And also, a uh, little fun fact, her son was baptized by our very own George Hupp. So I think that's really neat. Um, so all kinds of connections here. Uh, as we do, each time someone joins Crestview, I ask the questions of church membership. And so let me just uh, ask these five questions. And as I do, let's all kind of remember uh, the questions that we answered many years ago. The first question deals with our understanding of being human. And the question is, do you recognize that you are sinful and in need of God's grace? Do you? The second question deals with our understanding of who God is as he's revealed himself. Uh, do you believe in one God who has revealed himself in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? Do you? Now, the third question deals with our understanding of salvation. Uh, do you believe in Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, and do you rest upon him alone for your salvation, do you? The third is our understanding of sanctification, growing in our understanding of who we are as children of God. And, and the question is, uh, do you believe in the Holy Spirit? 
and promise to live a life as best you can that is led by the Spirit, do you? And the fifth question has to do with our understanding of uh, the church, um, the priesthood of all believers. And the question is, do you uh, promise to be active in the life of this church, participating in the worship and work of Crestview, do you? And do we, the members of Crestview, promise to support and encourage Annette and Carol Ann in their Christian walk, do we? Do. Let's all pray together. Our gracious God, we thank you for this beautiful day and we thank you for this gift of worship. Lord, we thank you that you arrange us into households of faith. And we thank you for this particular family here. Lord, we thank you that in your providence, you provide for us support and encouragement and correction and love. You give us people to grow with in faith. And we pray that for Carol Ann and Annette, their years here at Crestview will be filled with mission and ministry and opportunities for worship. We pray that they will be blessed by your church here and that as they grow here, the rest of the church will be, will be blessed by them. So Lord God, accept our prayers. We make them in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So I will give you all a chance to uh, go sit down and then during the, uh, at the end of the service... We'll see, okay? One thing I did not mention, well, we can clap if you'd like. Yeah, sorry about that. At the very top of my card, I have the word communion underlined, and I forgot to say that. So those of you who are at home, uh, we'll be celebrating communion today, and um, so go ahead and find your elements, and we'll do that here at about 10 o'clock. As we call ourselves to worship this morning, Lord Jesus, through our worship, teach us to model ourselves after you. Fill our hearts with joy and thanksgiving as we share your life and love with one another. By the power of your Holy Spirit, help us to protect and to build up those who are weak. Bring your people, all of us, together in unity, Lord, weak and strong, rich and poor, young and old, so that with one heart and one mind, we might glorify our Father in heaven and bring praise to your wonderful name. Lord, this morning in our worship, let us love one another.
It was October the 16th, uh, 2010, in Decorah, Iowa. You know where Decorah, Iowa is? Okay. Luther College was playing Central College in football. And there was a freshman playing for Luther College named Chris Norton. Chris was unusual because he was actually getting to play as a freshman in a college football game. He had been a great high school player. He played on special teams for Luther College. And on a kickoff, Chris was running down the field as fast as he could, and he lowered his head to make a tackle, and the crown of his helmet met the knee of the ball carrier. And he had a spinal cord injury. And like that, everything changed for the entire Norton family. Chris, of course, was airlifted to the University of Iowa Hospital. He was there for a number of months. He was given a 3% chance of ever moving anything below his neck. Can you imagine getting that word? You got a 3% chance of ever even doing this. And so he was surrounded by his parents and surrounded by this massive team of surgeons and physicians and nurses and PTs and OTs, and he made a decision, I will try to walk again. And so for months, he languished in that hospital bed, surrounded by these folks. And then, lo and behold, one day, he moved his finger just a little bit. And when the doctor said, oh, that's just, that happens, but don't get too excited about it. But he decided, I'm going to take this, and I'm going to use this as motivation for me. He was 18 years old, a former All-State football player. Now he was going to be a quadriplegic. He began to make a little bit of progress. And eventually, he went back to Luther College. He lived in a, a dorm area with a number of young men who were his roommates or sweet mates. And they decided, we're going to take care of Chris. And so these high college sophomores decided, we're going to do everything for him we can. They took him to the bathroom. They got him showered. They dressed him in the morning. They helped him get to class. They even at night, listen to this, would take turns sleeping next to him. And if he had a scratch or an itch on his nose, they would itch his nose for him. Can you imagine? Just the smallest little thing like that. Eventually, Chris began to do better. He eventually graduated from Luther College. And about the time he was graduating, he met a young woman named Emily. And she became his girlfriend and then his fiance. And eventually, on April the 21st, 2018, nearly eight years after his injury, the two of them were married. There was a documentary made about Chris's life called Seven Yards. And the reason it's called Seven Yards is because of this. He said to his fiancée, I will walk down that aisle with you. It will be a seven-yard walk. And so he did. And as I watched that documentary, and I watched him struggle to walk down that aisle, here's what occurred to me. Those might have been his legs moving, but there were hundreds of people who were moving them for him. His doctors, his nurses, his PTs, his OTs, his parents, his friends, his fiance. together they enabled him to take those steps seven yards down that aisle. It was a total team effort. In fact, there's a video I want to share with you. It's only 30, 90 seconds long. Check out the story of Chris Norton. The kid who wore number five in high school and 16 in college was given a 3% chance of ever moving again. I'm not going to be part of the 97% that doesn't recover from this. I had to relearn how to move different parts of my body to be standing was like a sense of freedom. And when I met Emily, everything changed. Chris came up with the idea of wanting to walk to get his diploma. We had no idea how he was gonna walk across the stage. He was working four or five hours every single day, sometimes even more. 
I went to that graduation walk knowing I busted myself for years. Christopher Norton. And if you can do a little bit more, a little extra on everything that you do, what you're supposed to do, that's when you can make the most significant impact and the biggest difference. I want to be able to walk Emily down the aisle of our wedding and we're gonna go seven yards. And I wanna walk with her side by side. I'm looking forward to the challenge. Probably should have passed out some tissues, shouldn't I have? Yeah, I couldn't watch it again. It, I don't watch, but maybe, I don't know. Now that we watch at our house. Uh, we're starting a series called Together. And we're going to look at how God arranges us in families. And it's an interesting time to talk about being a part of a church family because some of us are a church family together in person and others of us are a part of a church family online. It's, a, it's a, been a tough needle to thread, but we try to do it here at Crestview. So we're going to look at what it means to be together in community, together in service or mission, and then together in generosity as a family of faith. And today we're looking at community or fellowship. The fact that we are a family created by God for our own blessing. And so what we're going to do is look at some of Paul's letters, three different ones today. And what you're going to see is that at the end of his letters, Paul gets very practical. And so there's a lot of deep theology at the beginning of the letter. And then he says, and in light of everything I'm talking about theologically, here's how I want you to live. And so we're going to kind of look at those practical applications that he gives because I think it's important for us to understand that it's not just about theology <laughs> it's about how it meets our lives and how we live you know when I was in Charlotte we had a group of men in the church who met five mornings a week at 6 30 a.m. for breakfast the same group of men there were probably 14 of them and I would go join them occasionally and we would have this Bojangles breakfast they were called the Bojangles guys and literally, they were the only people in the restaurant other than those who worked there. And they would line up tables, kind of like King Arthur and the Knights of the Round, you know, long tables. They'd just move everything around to suit themselves. They'd get their sausage biscuits. They'd bring their own tomatoes and Duke's mayonnaise, and we would have sausage biscuits with tomato and Duke's mayonnaise. And they met every single weekday morning. They never missed a day. And I'll never forget, they all had assigned seats the day that one of them unexpectedly died. And we had his funeral, and it was really emotional. And the day after his funeral, I went to see the Bojangles guys. And when I got there, everyone was arranged around the table, but there was an empty chair. Nobody sat in his chair. They didn't move the chair away from the table and leave it where it was. No, they put a chair right there for him. And nobody sat there. And here's a question that I keep asking myself. Um, who are the people that will leave a chair for me? Who about you? In your life, who are those who are going to say, this is your chair right here, and it belongs to no one else but you? That's the beauty of of the family of faith. That's the beauty of the church. You know, we often kind of joke and laugh, you know, we all have our assigned seats, and, you know, you don't dare sit in someone's assigned seat. But I have to tell you, as I stand here, I kind of like knowing where you are. <laughs> I like being able to look out there and say, okay, there's, there, there. You know, we all have a seat at the table here at the church. And so what I want to do is look at what God has to say to us about life in the family, what it means to be together. And first of all, let's just take a look at what Jesus had to say. He says this, A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. And by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. That phrase, one another, you all, it appears over 60 times in the New Testament. I mean, we read time and time, be devoted to one another. Submit to one another, be at peace with one another, honor one another, encourage one another, serve one another, greet one another. 
the New Testament understands that you and I are to be together. We are to be with one another. And of course, the word for love here is the agape love, that self-sacrificing love. And so what we have is simply Jesus saying, I am the standard. As I have loved you, I want you to love one another. And of course, then in Matthew, if you've ever wondered where that phrase is that we read so often or speak so often of, where two or three are gathered in my name, Matthew 18, verse 20, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am with them. It is God's design that the church be the place where we belong. You know, one of the things that occurs to me, and see if you've ever thought about this. Amy Jo and I were talking about the other day. Uh, the household of God is going to last forever, throughout eternity. These are the people we're going to be in heaven with. Microsoft is going to go away. Apple is going to go away. Google is going to go away. All those things are going to pass away. This is what's going to remain. That's God's design for human life. You see, we live in a world where so many people are lonely. I mean, the, the statistics say that 40% of all Americans will say, I experience significant loneliness at certain periods of my week. 40%. So that means if there are 150,000 people in the area, Lee, I don't know, somewhere like 150,000 people within 10 miles of this place, Think of all the lonely people around us. And yet God has said, this is what I'm providing for you, a household, a family of faith, to be that antidote to loneliness. You know, Cincinnati, it's, a, it's an amazing place. And um, it's kind of a well-kept secret. Uh, I was at my college homecoming uh, weekend before last. And uh, they were saying, so you live in Cincinnati? I was like, yes, I live in Cincinnati. And they said, you know, I've never been there. I'm like, well, don't come. We're good. We don't need you. We're fine without you. You stay right down there where you are. But, but well, because I don't want him telling my secrets. So anyway, so, but what I've learned is, this is one of the top ten destinations for young professionals in the country. I mean, people are flocking here from all over. And what we're finding is, they come here from different places. They settle here. They're far from family. They're far from their original friend group. They then meet someone here who also is far from their family and their friend group, and they start a family together, and they have no family around. And so many of them are feeling isolated and lonely. I mean, you know, my 26-year-old son lives here. And last week, he was home for dinner. He lives at Downing High Park. He was home for dinner on Sunday, home for dinner on Monday, home for dinner on Tuesday, and came on Wednesday and did laundry and spent the night. You know, he just was a little lonely. And I kept wondering, where would he go if he didn't have that place to go? And so the church becomes a really important thing and a really important place. God has set this aside as his design for how you and I experience his love. Christian community is a gift. You know, when I was uh, working on these notes, actually, I was down in the mountains and uh, my wife uh, called one day and she said, my tires are way out of balance. I can barely drive the car. I said, did you hit anything? She said, no. Okay. So anyway, didn't debate that. So anyway, she had two friends from this church, because I'm far away. I'm 400 miles away. Two friends from this church who were like big brothers to her, who drove her car, who said, you know what, I think you're going to need to get new tires. So she called me, she said, so-and-so said I need to get new tires. And I said, isn't that great to be a part of the church? I said, did they offer to pay for the tires? She said, no, they did not offer to pay for the tires. <laughs> God has arranged us in a church family. So what does Paul have to say about it? Let's take a look at Romans chapter 15, and let's just kind of dive into some passages together. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind towards each other that Christ Jesus had. So he's the standard again. He's always the standard. So that with one mind and voice, you may glorify the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then here you go. Accept one another, there's that one another again, just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. What's the context here? You see, in Rome, the church is really growing. 
But you've got these Hebrew Christians and these Gentile Christians trying to be together in the same church. That's tough. For years and years, they would have nothing to do with one another. First of all, the Hebrews did not care for the Romans because those were the ones who are oppressing them. We don't like them. The Romans didn't care for the Hebrews because they were saying, you know, you think we're unclean. You'll have nothing to do with us. And then suddenly, they're in the church together. And so what we see is Paul saying, you got to accept one another. That's what it looks like. That is practical advice for how you and I live in the body. Now, when he says accept, it means receive one another, value one another, esteem one another. He's not saying you have to approve of everything that person does. I mean, how do we accept one another? What does he say here? You notice it? Just as Christ accepted you. And so does Christ approve of everything I do? No. There's, he accepts me. There are a lot in my life he does not approve of. We are told to receive one another, value one another, and esteem one another. You know, there's that wonderful story in the New Testament. The woman is caught in adultery. You know that story? I'm always amazed how she could have adultery by herself. But anyway, she's caught in adultery, right? And she's brought before these men. They're going to stone her to death. And Jesus says, all right, who's, whoever is without sin can throw the first stone. And slowly, one by one, they just drop their stones. First the old guys and then the younger guys. Then he looks at her and says, where are your accusers? And she says, they're not here, Lord. He says, I don't condemn you either. Now, what does he say? Go and sin no more. He accepted her. He received her. He valued her. He esteemed her. And then he said, but listen, there's some things that you probably want to change in your life. When you and I think about what it means to be a part of the body, we accept one another. We receive one another. We value and we esteem one another because we know that Jesus did that for you and me first. Well, that can be tough, though, can't it? Not only did they have differences back in the Roman church, we have our differences. We have different opinions about different things. We have different preferences and tastes. It's a part of being in the family of faith. How can we practically think about accepting one another? Well, take a look at these next passages because Paul gives us some great thoughts. So then, each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. So... First and foremost, we're going to receive one another because, hey, it's between me and God here. You know, when I go to be judged, God and I are not going to sit down and have a cup of coffee, and I'm going to say to God, or I'm not going to say to God, you know, what about how sinful Rodney was? Can you believe all the things Rodney did? I mean, come on. God's, we're not going to have that conversation. God's going to say, no, Rodney was an angel compared to you, Sean. We're going to give an account of ourselves to God. So immediately we're thinking, listen, I'm not going to be judgmental here because I've got plenty of things that God and I need to talk about. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. When I think about being judgmental, I have this thought. It's amazing how terrible my sins look when someone else is committing them. Think about that for a moment. It's amazing how terrible our sins look when someone else is doing it. When we see someone else who is very proud or arrogant or rude or greedy or very lazy spiritual, it's easy for us to say, boy, that looks terrible when we know that's really what's going on inside of us. And so he's telling those folks, you're going to accept one another. You know why? Because, first of all, it's between you and God, and you are not to be judgmental. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of another brother or sister. We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak. And then here you go. This is humility. And not to please ourselves, but to please our neighbors for their good. The attitude that we are to have is to regard one another and be humble about our own lives and put the needs of the other people around us first. So we're going to accept one another. Practical advice, life in the family. But there's more. What does it look like? Well, he then moves on to the Galatian church. Let's take a look at chapter 6. Now, in the Galatian church, it's a little different. There were those who were spiritually weak. And when you see the word weak in the New Testament, it's not wicked. There's a difference between wickedness and weakness. There were those who were spiritually weak and who were tempted. 
Now, you and I all know what it means like to be tempted. Maybe our temptation is to become bitter, or our temptation is to become angry, or our temptation is to become greedy or prideful. Our temptation might be just to forget about God altogether and be far from Him. What do we do with those around us who are just tempted? Well, here you go. Carry each other's burdens. I'm, I'm going to read this whole thing, then let's, then let's go back and, and look at it. Carry each other's burdens, and in this you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks they are something when they're not, <laughs> they deceive themselves. Each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. For each should carry their own load. Do you see, it, it, does that sound confusing to you? You know, on the one hand, carry each other's burdens. On the other hand, carry your own load. On the surface, that seems confusing. What, we carry our own? Do we carry each other's? What, what's going on here? Understand that in this language there at the end in verse 5, a load in this language is a purse or a briefcase or a backpack. Like think of a pack carried by a soldier. It's not difficult. It can be handled. We each have things in our life. We just got to carry it ourselves. There are things in your life only you can carry. There are things in my life only I can carry. That's what he's saying here. But a burden is very different. A burden is heavier. It's like a large boulder that we cannot bear alone. And there are people around you and me who are burdened right now. Burdened with grief or burdened with anxiety. Going through really difficult times. I know that if I found myself carrying a huge burden, I wouldn't try by myself. I'd be asking you to help me out. That's the way the church is designed. We enable the people to live and flourish because we help them out. And one of the things that occurs to me as I read this passage, thinking about helping carry one another's burdens, is that we can't carry a burden for someone else if our hands are already full. I mean, you know, when we were kids, we used to love to see people who had their hands full and say, hey, can I borrow a quarter from you when they, you know, their hands are already full? You can't, you can't do that. And so we have to learn to empty ourselves, humble ourselves, not be so consumed with self and our own things we're carrying, rather be prepared to help someone else carry theirs as well. And so we're going to accept one another, we're going to carry one another's burdens, and we need that desperately. And then the very final thing in 2 Corinthians 13. Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Strive for full restoration. Encourage one another. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. And here you go. Greet one another with a holy kiss. And all God's people here send their greetings. Now, a holy kiss was a customary greeting in that day. Ours is very different. Who here is grateful that ours is different from a holy kiss? I, yes, uh, yeah. I, I had never received a full body frontal hug from a guy until Jim Sparnell gave me one one day. You know? But that's the way we greet one another. We handshake, we touch hands, we hug, whatever the case may be. But what Paul is saying here is you acknowledge one another. You give one another your time. You give one another your attention. You show appreciation for one. You greet one another. You know, when you see someone out in the hallway, if maybe they're standing alone and you don't recognize it, you greet that person. We show hospitality. Again, who is going to be in heaven? The household of God. And so we have to acknowledge one another. You know, Paul, in his life, spent a lot of time on the road. You know, you read the, New Testament, read the book of Acts, he's always going from place to place to place, and you would think he might eventually say, I don't even have time for relationships anymore. I'm just going to I'm just going to dive in. I'm going to start this church and I'm going to dive out. But the truth is Paul established deep and abiding relationships. I mean when he said goodbye to the church at Ephesus, he was tearful with those elders. I had a, a friend of mine who was uh, in the military. And um he basically said, "You know, we moved around so much, we just quit trying to make friends because we just bounced from place to place to place. It was really hard." But in the church, what we're called to do is greet one another, acknowledge one another, love one another. You know, I've said goodbye to four different churches in the 30 years I've been a pastor. And it's always surprised me how emotional I get, you know, and how tearful I get. I'm just a pastor. 
But the truth is, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a unique relationship that we all have in the family of faith. And it's one that is cherished by God. And so life together, it's about accepting one another. It's about carrying one another's burdens and also just acknowledging one another and showing hospitality. I just love that story of, of Chris Norton. There in Decorah, Iowa, he thought it was over. What he did not realize was there would be hundreds of people who would walk with him. Let's pray. Our gracious God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for how good and kind you are to us. Lord, we thank you that you have arranged us in this church family. We thank you that here we are accepted and valued and esteemed. We thank you that here we have others who carry our burdens and help us. We thank you that here we have deep relationships and we have significance. Lord, we pray for the life and health of this church. We pray for this community where we live. We pray for this country. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Those of you who are at home, if you have your elements, we now go to God's table. Uh, speaking of community, uh, we are told that people are going to come from east and west and north and south and gather together at God's table in God's kingdom. And so this is merely a foretaste of that. On the night Jesus was betrayed, he was with his disciples celebrating the Passover feast. And it was during the meal that he gave the feast new meaning and new significance. And a new covenant was established. He said to them at that meal, this is my body broken for you. And take and eat. And when you do this, remember me. And then in the same manner, he took the cup. He said, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood for the forgiveness of your sins. All of you drink of it. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim my death until I come again. And so, friends, these are the gifts of God for you and me, the people of God. And as we prepare to go to the table, I'd like to ask you just to take a few moments and um, silently enter into a time of confession. So let's confess our sins together. Lord, you teach us that the proof of your amazing love is this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so receive the confessions of our heart, made in Christ's name. Amen. And let us now have communion together. We stand for our closing prayer, our Lord's Prayer.
Dear family, go in peace. Go in the love of God the Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of God's Holy Spirit. May the Lord bless you today and forever. Amen. Thank you.